Okay, so I think we are live. Welcome to a new Actinovase e-seminar. Today I'm delighted to be hosting this session because we have two people that I admire so much. We have Jana Schnitte and also Nelly Salem, a nice German-UK collaboration, Mexico also collaboration. And and Jana did her PhD in Paul Hoskinson lab at the University of Strathclyde. And actually she is a postdoctoral researcher in Lorena Fernandez Martinez lab at Edge Hill University. And Nelly, she did her PhD and also a postdoc in Paco Barone Gomez lab at Lange Bios in Vesta. Now she is a professor at the Center of Mathematical Science in Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México in Morelia. So they are talking today about ACDES, that is a curated actinobacterial database for evolutionary studies. And I think that first will be Jana speaking and then we'll be turning to Nelly to the second part. So questions will be at the very last part of the talk. I will be reading them. So if you have any questions, please put them on the YouTube channel. And I think that's it. So Jana, whenever you are ready, you can start with the presentation. Okay, hey, thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone. And first of all, thank you to um, Actinobase for this opportunity and um, also to Agus for this very nice introduction. Um, yes, today it's um, Nelly and myself and we would like to talk to you about ACTIS, a curated actinobacterial database for evolutionary studies. Um, this work was um, a collaboration that um, happened between um, Paco Barona Gomez's lab and Paul Hoskinson's lab um, during Nelly's and my PhD. And there were also Pablo and Anna involved. Um, Pablo was a PhD student and postdoc in Paco's lab and Anna was another PhD student of Paul's. And um, our talk is divided into two parts. So I will give you a bit of the, the background and like the, the history of why um, we've um, created this database and what it can be used for and give you a brief overview. overview. And uh, Nelly will then give you a bit more of a, of a technical insight and a quick run through of how you can actually use this database for your own um, research questions. Um, at the like bottom of the slide, you also have our contact details. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop us a message. If you want to like use it and you get stuck or anything, uh, we're always happy to help. So with this, um, I'll, I'll get started. So uh, what is ACTIS? Um, so the paper was published in January this year um, and it's a curated actinobacterial database for evolutionary studies. It contains a total of 612 actinobacterial genomes and, and allows you to do comparative genomic studies and do a gene expansion analysis of, of primary metabolism. Um, the link is also um, given on the slide if you want to have a closer look at it. And um, basically, I've, I'll start now to give you a bit of, of the background. So it really I think it started at a conference in, can't remember if it was 2012 or 2013, where um, I presented a, a poster at a, um, um, SFAM Applied Microbiology annual meeting and Paco was there and he was um, like saying, oh, you know, one of my PhD students has like similar interests. And then we kind of started um, collaborating also because Paco and Paul knew each other. so. It kind of, um, yeah, we just started to kind of put our efforts together. And ultimately it resulted, um, because of these shared interests, this resulted that um, in a three months visit uh, for myself in, at the Langevio in 2015, um, where uh, ACTUS was then um, really developed. Uh, so my, my PhD was on the, the title was systems biology approach for metabolic engineering in streptomyces, the phosphoenol pyruvate pyruvate oxaloacetate node. And um, you can see there is um, this, um, like this graph here of, of um, the phosphoenol pyruvate pyruvate oxaloacetate node. And you can see these are all the genes that are 
um, from streptomycecilicolor encoding these functions. And something that was quite striking was that um, sometimes there's more than one gene. And I was really interested in understanding why, why are there several genes for the same function? Is this of importance? Are they redundant? How does it all work? And how does, is this related into um, specialized metabolism? Are these good targets for metabolic engineering? Does it matter if you knock out one or the other? So there were like lots of, of these questions, but obviously I was looking just at one organism and it was like, okay, how can we look at this in, in a more uh, systematic, uh, systematic way and, and um, covering more um, species? Um, and then um, Anna, uh, the, the other PhD student from uh, Paul's lab, uh, she was working in um, uh, a project engineering streptomyces clavuligerus for efficient growth on sustainable carbon sources. And one part of her PhD was looking into the evolution of glucose uptake. And um, this will be the, the example that Nelly um, will show you uh, a bit later on. Um, and so, yeah, like this picture here is like just a world map and the kind of the highlighted parts is where um, all the collaborators are. And these are like some of the mutants that overproduce actina rodent. And um, so this was kind of the, the background from the, the Strathclyde uh, uh, lab. And then um, the other, um, background um, here is, is what like Pablo and Nelly were interested in. So you all might have heard of, of evil mining, um, which is a tool that Pablo um, started developing during his PhD and Nelly later um, developed this into a standalone um, an analytical tool. And um, what evil mining does is, is like looking at um, metabolic expansions and how these might be recruited into uh, specialized metabolism. So as you can see, there are these parallels and because of the questions that I had in my PhD, um, we, we were like, oh, you know, maybe this first part of evil mining, um, as you can see, there is like this genome database here um, could be like the starting point for answering those questions that I had um, in my PhD. And uh, basically that's that's what I did. So Pablo had like the uh, the first evil mining um, database contained, I think 230 genomes and um, the evil mining 2.0, uh, which Nelly later developed actually contains more than a thousand actinobacterial genomes, but also other genera. But um, obviously there are more databases involved because they then look at how these, um, uh, these metabolic expansions and enzymes are conserved and how they will might have been recruited into specialized metabolism. But there is like this first step that is um, uh, related to um, the ACTAS database. Um, and so here is just an, an overview of, um, of like the, the workflow of how we created uh, ACTAS. So first of all, it was how to select uh, the genome. So we set certain criteria to uh, pick a uh, genome. So I was obviously very interested in, in streptomyces. Um, so a lot, large part of the genomes are actually streptomyces is almost half of the genomes are streptomyces. Um, and the, they are also very abundant, <laughs> obviously for genome sequences compared to many of the other uh, genera. Um, so we had this, it needs to have um, less than 100 contexts per two megabases genome sequence. And we wanted to, uh, to have quite a broad range of um, representation across um, the actinobacteria. Um, then from these genomes, we downloaded their, um, all the sequences and um, run them through RAST for an annotation. And then we did two different um, kind of paths. So one is, is this green one here, which is the gene expansion analysis. So we downloaded all the annotated files, extracted the functions, um, a functions list for each genome um, and counted the number of genes for the particular function. And then in the end created a heat map um, 
to highlight those uh, expansions. I'll, I'll explain this uh, a bit more um, in one of the following slides. And here there was like the biggest um, curation step really where we like looked for duplicates um, using EC numbers and we organized the functions into pathways. And uh, because my main interest was in central carbon metabolism, obviously um, that, that's like the heat map covers uh, central carbon metabolism. And then we calculated the mean uh, gene number per genera and highlighted um, those that are like more abundant um, in, in this heat map. And on, on the other side, this blue um, pathway on, on this side here, there is, um, you, you then can download each of, of the genomes, create a, a blastable database and then create alignments and run phylogenetic trees. And I mean, here, you know, we, we used muscle and quick tree, but obviously you can use um, whichever tool you, you want to use. There is no, like, you know, you don't have to um, use what we used here. Um, so yes, uh, with this, like how, how did we select the genome? So I was using um, the NCBI taxonomy browser. So there's like this very simple search function. Then you just like click, yes, please show me the ones that have a genome sequence and then hit go. And you end up with like a lovely list of all the different species. And then you can like um, download all these uh, genomes, which yeah, it took me quite uh, quite some time, um, as you can imagine. And um, then here is is an RPOB tree collapsed down to um, the different uh, families um, uh, using. So these are contains all our six hundred twelve species, which cover eighty different genera and um, yeah, thirteen suborders and um, yeah. Um, this is down to like family level. Um, and yeah, this is just to kind of illustrate the range of, of um, species and genera that we've covered. Um, so this is basically the, the, this heat table that you saw at the end of that green pathway on the right hand side of that flow chart that I showed you earlier. Um, and I have um, highlighted here Streptomyces. Um, which was obviously my main interest. And you can see here, we had 289 um, species that were from um, the, the genus of Streptomyces. And here at the top, you have your pathway and um, the functions with the EC number. And I've highlighted here uh, the pyruvate kinase, which was one of the enzymes that I was really interested in. And as you can see, that came up as a um, as an expanded um, enzyme uh, in Streptomyces. And and the way we calculated this, um, just to to like explain this in detail, the means were um, the means of for each one of those functions was uh, calculated per genera, and then we calculated an overall means um, across all the different genera plus the standard deviation. And that value was then used to compare it with each genera again to see, so if that genera, so for example, if um, so 1.5 was then higher than the overall means plus standard deviation across all the, the different genera. So then we call this likely to be an expansion. And those were the ones that um, I then had a, a closer look into at least for like streptomyces. Um, and um, so basically, so I did this for glycolysis and like the other um, central carbon metabolic pathways as well. Um, and yeah, so this is kind of just an example of, of when you then, what you can then do. So from that heat table, um, I looked at the pyruvate kinases. So Actually, the, the detailed work was um, published previously as well in uh, MBIO. So if you're interested to read like all the details on that, um, I'll just uh, yeah, guide you towards uh, this publication. Uh, but just to quickly summarize it, there are um, two copies of pyruvate kinase and this incredibly conserved across uh, Streptomyces. So out of the 289 species covered, 
281 HEF2 copies. Um, and when we, we knocked out uh, the enzymes, at least for the PIG1 mutant, we saw that we we saw that there was an increased quelimycin uh, production. Um, and then we were, were interested in understanding, okay, why, I mean, clearly they have different phenotypes and um, the, the mutants are in, you know, showing the same phenotype. So let's have a look at, at the gene expression. Um, however, that didn't really uh, show us very much because both were expressed um, and uh, like cons constitutively. And, um, but what we found was when we overexpressed the enzymes and purified them, that their kinetics were quite different. Um, and while they're both regulated by AMP, um, PERC-1 is a lot more sensitive to it, and it's also regulated by ribulose 5-phosphate. Um, and it basically led um, us to the um, hypothesis that PERC-1 is like stimulated during starvation period. So actually these two enzymes both contribute to the fitness uh, of Streptomyces silicala and um, it's very conserved and it's actually quite important to understand the roles of, of these potentially, like you would think maybe redundant enzymes, but they're not really redundant because they play different physiological roles for the organism and they both contribute to the fitness of the organism as well. Um, so that was kind of uh, one, one way of using actors. And um, with this, I will uh, now hand over to Nelly, who is going to give you a bit more of a, of a technical run through and um, show you of how, how to use this. So I will stop sharing my screen and um, Nelly can share and uh, start presenting her part of the presentation. Well, hello, everybody. Thanks, Jana. Um, as Jana has said, ACTES uh, is a set of scripts that produces uh, from a set of genomes a frequency table that is a comparative of the number of copies that a certain function has in an actinobacterial genomes. So uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about how ACTES work. After we have downloaded uh, the genomes from NCBI, then um, we annotate those genomes in Rust. We extract all the uh, compressed files uh, from annotations, and then uh, we go until uh, the generation of a heat map. Um, Rust, uh, I just want to let you know that it is an automated uh, genome annotation services. Since we wanted to know uh, how many copies of a certain function it was in a genome, so we decided to take advantage of these annotation services uh, and then only classifies each function per genome. So what you give to Rust as an input is um, a contig file with the DNA of a certain organism, a genome file, and then Rust transforms this uh, raw data into annotated uh, files uh, that each file contains the number of uh, the gene, an ID for the gene like this one, and then the start and end coordinates. And what it is important to us, the function that these genes is uh, probably doing in the genome and also to which metabolic subsystem those, um, that gene belongs. So we automatized this workflow for the 600 uh, genomes, and we uh, construct a tool that is called MyRAS, so we can do everything uh, from download the genomes uh, in NCBI until uh, download, uh, annotate in Rust and download uh, genome annotations from Rust. So we automatized all this process. And um, what we get from Rust are those uh, these four files, annotations, bindings, that it is a little more specialized uh, because it says from which metabolic subsystems each function belongs, and then the amino acid annotations and nucleotide FASTA annotations. All these data are available at Senodo, so you can download the data if you want to use it from the 612 genomes of good quality in actinobacterial. Um, you can download it if you want. 
So the output of ACDES is a frequency table as the one that I am showing here. Uh, in each row, there is a function, a metabolic function. And in each column, we have a different actinobacterial genome. And the numbers here is uh, how many copies of this function does the, this genome have? And also, uh, Beyond that, more than the number of copies, we have uh, the IDs of those genes. And with this list of genes, for example, for one function, like these two like, that I am showing here, glucokinase and glucose permease, um, we can construct the trees and infer phylogenetic relationships from them. Um, for example, with ACDES, we found differences between actinobacterial expansions in permease glucokinase system. This was doing during Anna's PhD. And as I am showing you here, uh, all these nodes are uh, the copies uh, for actinobacterial genomes of the glucose permease um, enzyme. And what we have here are the colors. Uh, for example, in green, we see the organisms that only has one copy. In yellow, we see organisms with two copies of this enzyme and in violet three copies and in red four copies. So here we can see the number of copies of each uh, genome. And uh, what we see in other color uh, behind is the, the genus of these organisms. So for example, uh, here there is a, a zone where we see uh, multiple expansions. Uh, this is streptosporangium and so we can see that there is an expansion in GLCP in a streptophilum, sorry, streptosporangium uh, genus. So um, we can see that in streptomyces, the expansion is greater for glucokinase than for GLCP. Uh, why I'm saying this? Because we can see that all these uh, nodes are in yellow color. So we can see that there is, um, at least two copies in these organisms. Now we can see uh, that it is streptomyces, the genus that it is uh, with these extensions. And we can also go into microreact. I want to show you microreact in case you haven't used it. We consider it is a great tool. Um, here, here you can see the tree. And you can color by different metadata. For example, you can color by number of copies. And now, if you uh, mouse over over one of these uh, colors, you can see that it is streptomyces, the one who is having the expansion. So this is how we can say that this enzyme Um, GLK has more expansions than GLCP in at least in actinobacteria. So in synthesis, uh, you can use ACDES to compare the number of copies of a certain enzyme in actinobacterial genomes. You can go um, even uh, in the Jupyter, in the GitHub repository. Here is the GitHub repository for ACDES. Here you have the data that it is um, the genomes with the annotations that I have showed you uh, before. It's genome files with annotations. And there is also the output. So I think it's easy to use. And it also contains a Jupyter a notebook embedded in the GitHub repo. So um, you, can, you can actually run this Jupyter notebook. You just have to click here and the notebook is going to start. And then you can, oh, you can go over there. Oh, seems like it is open already here. Yeah, I have it open here before. And you can actually run the code. So you don't have to worry for installations or that the data is not there. You just have to start and the code, um, all the code that we use to produce 
uh, the, the heat map, it's already here. And here are all the instructions. For example, here is uh, where is the annotation directory? How can you produce the tables? Here's exactly how you can run the scripts. So you can go uh, one by one through this uh, tutorial and you will have exactly the same results. So Agdes is perfectly reproducible. You can um, try it if you want. And also uh, I want to, to let you know that there are other resources to explore primary metabolism. For example, Good Smash is an amazing resource produced by Victoria uh, that goes more uh, than only gene expansion, beyond gene expansions, and she explores uh, primary metabolism, but at the level of conservation of gene clusters. So maybe you can combine these tools if you are interested in primary metabolism. You can first look for uh, gene expansions and then for a conservation at gene clusters from primary metabolism. What we consider as an opportunity to expand ACDES, uh, we think that maybe we can include another uh, annotators, genome annotators, for example, PROCA. And also another thing that we can do or you can do if you are interested in this subject is you can use this amazing tool from Cabling uh, called NCBI Genome Download, where you can only uh, type the, the phylogeny uh, lineage that you are interested, for example, Actinobaculum or Mycobacterium. And then uh, with this tool, you can uh, retrieve all those genomes from NCBI and go for the annotation and then use ACTES. So I think it's um, there are so many more tools than when we, Jana and I, started the PhD, but we hope that you find ACTES useful. What we find ACTES useful for is for explore a um, phylogeny of a gene protein in Actinobacteria to explore gene expansions, events across actinobacteria, identify targets for metabolic engineering. Um, we also value that it is a uh, very versatile, so you can tailor to whatever your needs are. And finally, uh, we value that there is no need for coding experience because you can use the Jupyter notebook and run every instruction there, or you can just go to Zenodo and download the data and the outputs. Um, and just uh, look for the enzyme that you are interested in some of the actinobacterial uh, lineages. So that's all on your side. We thank you very much for your attention. Um, here are all the authors of the work. And please, if you have any questions, they are welcome. Okay, so thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And I truly want to say a big thank you because you have been developing all these tools that we use for also mine our data and truly has been a contribution to our knowledge of actinomycetes. So thank you both. And now I will see if there is some questions from the audience. If not, I have a couple. I want to <laughs> speak a lot <laughs> about this <laughs> because I found it truly fascinating. So let me check in the chat if there is someone that wants to ask something. I mean, I can just say if you know there are questions later and people, you know, they can just contact us as well. Um, feel free to reach out if you want to use it and get stuck anywhere. Um, we would love for, you know, the community to keep using it. Um, it's, um, yeah, I will uh, pass our email addresses. <laughs> yes, so Oli can um, post the email address on the chat. Perfect, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I will start with the question. So Jana, you told us that there were two copies of the pyruvate kinase, right? Mm -hmm. And they were truly, really conserved. Yes. And you showed that when you muted, I think it was uh, the one. 
Yeah, the, the big one. one. Yeah, you have an increase in colimacin production. So, did you try also to make a mutation in the pig two? Yes. And yeah. To see yeah, what so happened. Actually, uh, we is is uh, because basically I had um, well actually um, when I started my PhD um, a lot of the mutants were already made so Lorena had uh, made them and then Pablo <laughs> also had made some mutants and it's actually quite difficult sometimes to um, to um, tease these phenotypes apart like I was looking I think it was 14 genes in total and I tested them on so many different conditions and media just to see if there was any difference but because they are primary metabolism you know it's very sometimes they're very subtle um, and uh, so yeah the phenotypes aren't that easy to tease out um, with with this I found at least um, so it was nice to see that there was something <laughs> Uh, at, at least for one of them. And obviously that kind of triggered us to look further into it because it seemed like, okay, there's just a phenotype for one of them. Why is that the case? Um, and our first thought was like, oh, you know, they will be differentially expressed, but they weren't. And then we did the whole overexpression. And yeah, so yeah, that, that was a lot of work. But yeah, like I, I feel like the actors really helped to kind of understand the how how conserved this was and, and how important it also is to look into these different um yeah really go into detail for all these different events and really showing that they are not redundant but they each play a different role and if we mm -hmm. really want to understand it and you know um, metabolically engineer these strains it's important to look at it and not just in one species but getting that kind of bigger picture um okay. yeah <laughs> so we have questions. So ah, it's from Lorena, actually. She said, fantastic talk, really informative and useful. What do you think is the reason for these duplications? Um, I mean, across all the expansions that we observed in Streptomyces, there were only, um, I think, two duplications. Um, and I mean, to be honest, I think it's probably to give them a more versatile um, or flexible way of, of adjusting to different environmental conditions, um, because obviously they live in such complex uh, environments, they might have to be very, you know, quickly adaptable. So if they even if they express both of these genes, but then the the um, um, you know, there's suddenly more AMP, one of the enzymes um, reacts very differently to it. So there's a quick way of the organism to adapt to new conditions. Um, so I think that's part of the reason, but yeah, I think there is still lots more um, to discover on that and looking also in, you know, in, into other genes to try and uncover what the, what are the different reasons? Because I think it's probably very, context specific and also where you know how how this root connects to to the rest of the metabolism and maybe which precursor supply it, it feeds into and um yeah I, I really think that prime metabolism has so much to teach us and i hope that you know more research will be done into this because it's kind of you know the kind of underlying feed into all the interesting um secondary and uh, specialized metabolism. So I think understanding this will be crucial in the kind of future as well. Yes, definitely. Another question, Morgan Frini. I would like to say something oh, about yes, the please. duplications because Lorena has another question uh, after that about the same topic. So I think we can- Yes, uh, yes, we can <laughs> put them together. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to read the question for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, Lorena says, uh, do you know if these duplications are common in other phyla or is it this a feature of actinobacterial genomes? Okay, so what I want to say is that expansions that comprises duplications and horizontal gene transfers occurs all the time. So, but we only see those who are fixed uh, through some evolutionary process and it uh, how much are we are going to see it in other phyla? It depends of the 
composition of the pangenome. As Hannah said, Streptomyces is a very adaptable or microorganism that lives in very environments. So it conserves many of these uh, expansions, uh, either duplications or horizontal gene transfers. And we can see them because um, they are fixed maybe in some cluster of uh, secondary metabolism uh, doing another function, or maybe in the examples that Hannah has shown us in primary metabolism, but maybe with a different regulation or doing some slightly different functions. So how many expansions are in other phyla? It depends of the, um, as I said, of the pangenome, if it is open, if it is closed. It, it is not like for the phyla um, invariant, but maybe for the kind of life that the organism has. For example, some parasitic organisms has a really uh, closed uh, pangenome, so we don't see many duplications in there. But organisms uh, that are uh, ubiquitous, like streptomyces, yeah, we, we can see many expansions um, and a an really open pangenome in streptomyces, just like that. Yes, perfect, good. Thank you, Nelly. So, okay, the next question. Now I get to the question of Morgan Frini. Uh, he says, really fantastic talk, such, such a great tool. Thank you so much for the tour. I was wondering how well this pipeline would work for non-enzymes, for example, transcription factors, maybe. Have you tried that? Um, I mean, I think, you know, you have both available. So, I mean, all, everything that we've shown now was on enzymes, but obviously you have the nucleotide database as well. So, you know, you can use that as well. Um, I've not used it for transcription factors, but I've, I've looked for like um, um, group two intron elements um, across it. So, um, just to draw like some phylogenetic trees and see how how abundant they they are, and I mean obviously because it's complete genome, so it's really open for what you can use it. So I would just say you know please use it and uh, and we can see where it leads us, and then obviously you know maybe there will need to be some adjustments, but in theory I can't see any like problem why it shouldn't work with. Uh, like you know, non and not enzymes. Um, so I think what is nice about this is like is is a curated database, but you can use it for a lot of different questions, um, and it can be tailored for your own needs. And I think that's why we really want to share this as well, so that people are aware that it exists and that um, it's there to be used um, and improved, and you know, growing it and all that. So. Definitely. So we have to start using it and see whatever it leads us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for developing this tool. So there is no more questions for the from the audience, I think, but I have one more and it's for Nelly. So you mentioned that you use RAS to annotate the genomes, right? And one opportunity in the future will be to expand to add also PROCA annotations. And I also noticed that Rust is some uh, server that you use for Corazon, and it's very fast to annotate a genome. And I know that is why you have chosen this server to make the annotation. But why do you think, and what is your opinion, that it's not so popular when you have a genome and you try to annotate this, because we also see that you use the NCBI annotator pipeline or the PROCA pipeline. So what do you recommend? Do you recommend that we start using Rust a little bit more or we just have to keep using the three of them in parallel, depending on the question? This is more like a technical question for you. What do you recommend for us, the users? <laughs> Well, I guess it depends on, on your work. What I recommend is that you choose one and keep consistent with that one. Because uh, at the beginning we were using NCBI and Rust, and then it was complicated because NCBI sometimes changed the IDs because uh, there is a new version or a new release. So we decided to uh, stay with Rust for that reason. 
because that way we have the numbers and the numbers, the internal numbers were not going to change. And it was easy to share the genomes with the group. But it is not like uh, I recommend that everybody uses the same annotator than me. Uh, I just feel like everybody ha should have their favorite uh, annotation system and keep use it consistently in the work. I think Rust is not uh, going to use it um, much now because it's integrated into Patrick, that it is uh, another system uh, and K-based that uh, to comparative microbial genomics. And so maybe we are not seeing Rust, but Rust is inside there uh, um, in the background of Patrick. So everyone can use their favorite annotation systems, I feel. <laughs> Thank you, Nelly. So we have ah, an information from Paul Hoskinson. He says he, yes, you can search for regulatory proteins too. He has done it. So there is uh, <laughs> your first user, <laughs> Jana. <laughs> Paul has done it. So you can know that it's also for regulatory proteins too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you girls for this amazing talk and also for all the team, all the efforts that you have put on this. Uh, thank you, Pablo and Anna also that they have been present with you working on this act desk and also with uh, Paul Hoskinson and Paco Barona Gomez that have guided you all this. And tour. also Ian. <laughs> Ian, yes. Ian Hunter as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your efforts. I hope that this new tool, I know that it will be for major contributions into our field. That has been the Evo Mining and Corazon tools that we all have used it. So thank you for that also Nelly and all the team. Uh, so if you have more questions, uh, these two girls are adorable, so you can contact her, <laughs> them. <laughs> the mails are in the YouTube channel. And also stay tuned because the next speaker will be uh, Pablo. So we will we'll continue with Mexican speakers. That's such a nice thing to have uh, Latin America power in here. <laughs> So stay tuned, uh, two more weeks, we will have pa uh, Pablo speaking also into the next seminar. So I think that's it. Thank you once again, girls, for this amazing talk. And of course, we will be on contact uh, soon. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. And Bye. thanks for 